Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the fourth unit of the course Phonetics and Phonology Abroad Overview. This uh, unit is on speech perception and um, in this unit we will cover how we hear, how we make sense of the sounds that we hear. So uh, as we have seen in the three units before this, speech is for fast and efficient communication and speech is composed of units called phonemes. So, ba, pa are two phonemes in I suppose any language or bat and pat in English. So, the fundamental unit is generally considered to be the phoneme. Native English speakers typically produce 12 phonemes per second and can comprehend up to 50 phonemes per second. So, this is a very fast rate of recognition as well as production. When you talk about speech perception, is it true that even in speech perception, phoneme is considered the basic unit? Yes, it is even in speech perception, phoneme is considered to be the basic unit for uh, understanding speech. And there have been uh, some perception uh, research which tried to locate a better unit uh, than a phoneme for um, understanding how humans perceive speech. But the basic unit of speech perception uh, in all these studies were um, not uh, satisfactory. The ones that were proposed were not satisfactory. So, the units which were proposed were below the phoneme. Uh, level of the phoneme, the phonological features to above it, diphone syllables to no uh, lexical unit or sublexical unit at all. All these approaches were not finally good enough to capture the processes involved in understanding speech or to perceive speech. Listeners need to recognize words, units of chunks of speech, and it involves distinguishing a word one word from all other words in a context in the neighborhood of a sentence. So, speech signals are continuous and it is hard to discern where one word ends and another begins, let alone locate the borders of individual phonemes. So, it is not only difficult to determine the units of speech, but it is also difficult to locate the boundaries of these units of speech. So, speech perception is indeed a difficult process that is performed by humans all the time while speaking and listening and understanding speech. So, what happens in this process? Speech is the result of air that is pushed from the lungs through the vocal cords and into the vocal tract. Now, vowels are produced by vibration of the vocal cords and the spectral shape uh, given to it by the vocal tract. Uh, these changes, these spectral shape changes causes changes in the resonances, the resonant frequency and produce peaks in energy and peaks in pressure at a number of different frequencies and these are called formants. The first formant has the lowest frequency and then the second and so on. There, there are many formants whenever uh, there is some fundamental frequency. Sound spectrograms show uh, the changes in frequency and intensity for speech. 
and uh, consonants are produced by constriction at any part of the vocal tract and form and changes are rapid uh, changes in frequency and seen as movements to and out of a consonant. So, this is the part of speech the acoustic aspects which we studied in unit 2 and you have a good knowledge of the acoustic aspects of speech which we are repeating now. When it comes to speech perception, the part which is important in the acoustic signal is the part that there are no breaks in the continuous acoustic signal. Whenever we are saying a sentence, we are not particularly paying attention to giving breaks between the words. We speak everything in one go unless there are other prosodic aspects to, to be taken care of, we are not really paying attention to the boundaries between the words. This creates what is known as the variability problem. There is no simple relation between the acoustic signal and individual phonemes. So, this means that the phonemes, the, the acoustically, the phonemes are subject to a lot of changes, some of which you had seen in the lectures on acoustic phonetics. Phonemes vary in spectral shape based um, on the context, based on the in the context in which, in which they appear. So, depending on in the following vowel, cart uh, will have the k there will have a different spectral, um, different form and transitions unlike uh, kit. So, this is what we talked about in the first class that they are different in the way the acoustic shape of the, um, the properties will show. And part of the problem there is also that of co-articulation. So, none of the sounds that we produce in the words are actually completely separate. So, while producing a vowel, it carries information about the following, following consonant and so on and so forth. So, they cannot be really separated, one cannot be separated from the other and as a result of co-articulation. So, as we already studied, these are gestures, these are movements from one position to from one target to another and before the completion of one target, the movement for the second target already starts and which results in issues of variability and uh, co-articulation, etc. So, uh, this is a um, spectrogram showing the spectrogram of I, O, U, or Yo, Yo. So, there are no pauses or breaks between the words and the absence of breaks in the acoustic signal creates the segmentation problem. So, now what are the other issues related to variability? Different speakers, so speakers speak differently, each speaker, different speakers will have different ways of pronouncing production of sounds and there could be mannerisms etcetera which should lead to differences in uh, the way sounds are produced. Also, there are other issues which can be related to a person's geographical um, uh, origins, so that is to say dialects, so uh, different uh, regions speak different, uh, produce different uh, dialectal variations. There could be also variations based on gender, based on uh, the people have shown that, that there could be different groups of society can produce, can uh, have uh, their own unique way of uh, producing sounds depending on various issues like social strata, etc. So, those are also factors affecting variability of the sound. So, perception in spite of segmentation and variability problems. Now, we perceive, human beings perceive speech quite well despite all these variability in the signal. So, there are many, many variables which occur in the speech of any uh, individual and the listeners are able to uh, decipher or able to understand whatever is conveyed by the speaker. So, in acoustic uh, research, there have been 
research on invariant acoustic cues. So, short term spectrograms are used to investigate invariant acoustic cues. Um, some invariant cues were have been actually discovered for speech. So, this is a spectrogram um, and a waveform, but uh, uh, short term spectrograms can give more information about the harmonics, about the amplitude etcetera and whereas, um, wideband spectrograms gives you uh, more information about performance etcetera. So, uh, spectrograms are used for acoustic analysis and they have been shown to, to show invariant acoustic cues. So, is perceiving speech uh, simply a matter of the spectral properties, the, the timing properties and can acoustic phonetic invariance always determine perception. So, uh, here we show a few diagrams which show that actually uh, the acoustic phonetic invariance um, cannot always tell us about perceptual cues. So, because of the variability that we already talked about. So, acoustic phonetic invariance says that phonemes should match one and only pattern in the spectrogram that is uh, to say that uh, each consonant and each vowel will have only one pattern. Now, uh, this is shown uh, in the diagram uh, in front of you. You can see that these are form and transitions for one consonant the and this is the transitions that you see all along in this graph. Uh, it starts from D as in, in deep and day as in date and day as in deck and dot or da as in dot and dog and uh, dope. So, uh, in all these vowel um, in the presence of the, these different vowels we can see that the formants vary greatly. So, we know the, the form and transitions are quite different. So, uh, the formants themselves will be different of course, we know that because the vowels are determined. Um, so, the uh, we, we know from our lectures on acoustic phonetics that if it is a high vowel then we have low f 1 and the difference between f 1 and f 2 is quite big and that is because of deep the E there. But what is important to note here is that form and transitions are very different or can be um, the movement in and out um, could be quite drastically different and you can see that for the front vowels and the back vowels they are completely different while uh, it is uh, sort of rising. So, you can see of um, like a falling one second f 2 for do and um, for s for sorry for dot and dog and dope quite different from d uh, as in deep and day as in date and day as in deck. So, is it possible that phonemes will match only one and only um, one pattern in the spectrogram? So, we saw the example of d and that is not true. Uh, so, again here the formant of the can rise or fall depending on the vowel as you can see. And again here um, the the do they are quite different for both in one uh, these movements are called form and transitions which you already know from our acoustic analysis class lecture. And um, form and transitions are the major cues for perceiving uh, consonants and we will have a look at that again. So, we hear different consonant sounds because uh, we are sensitive to various aspects of form and transitions, but even for one sound there are different form and transitions and we are sensitive to minute differences in form and transitions for the same consonant. So, for example, for a given vowel sound a neighboring consonant sounds could be distinguished by the duration of form and transition and apart from the movement of rising and falling it is also duration which plays a role. So, we saw that uh, in where the acoustic phonetic 
invariance issue that one phoneme will always have a specific um, acoustic cues associated to it is cannot be uh, true because we saw with the example of the that depending on the vowel the form and transitions are very different. The temporal structure of acoustic energy is critical for speech perception. So, apart from the spectral shape, the temporal structure is also important for speech perception. So, now uh, we come to a big issue in speech perception which is called the segmentation problem. So, segmentation problem is arises because speech is um, not always speech a sentence or a continuous speech is not always marked by periods of long silences between words. So, um, this is another silence that we need to talk about the silence between two stops. So, this uh, the silence between um, the in the presence of a stop. So, this one which we know uh, that is the period of silence because of stops because the two stops here uh, needs a period of closure and then release and that silence is always compensated for. And here in the word captain, so the silence that uh, was preceded before the release of the two stops seems uh, easily compensated for. So, how do we uh, perceive speech? One of the very important things that speech research has shown over the years is categorical perception. And uh, what is categorical perception? Categorical perception is a phenomenon in which the brain assigns a stimulus um, into one category, but never into the uh, intermediate category. So, basically the brain divides sounds into categories and nothing in between. So, there are no categories which are intermediate. So, they are either this category or that category. For example, let us take the two sounds, uh, two syllables ba and pa and ba is formed by stopping the flow of air from the lungs. So, the voice onset time is shorter and unlike pa, the voice onset time for pa is longer because um, it is a voiceless sound. Also, again what is categorical perception? Categorical perception is the ability to hear categories and never anything intermediate. So, English speakers will hear ba or pa, but will not hear anything in between. So, let us also talk about cues. We have already mentioned invariant um, cues. So, what are cues? Cues are aspects of the signal that contains minimum recoverable acoustic information. And they are necessary for the speaker to recover a contrast and they are related to the developments in distinctive uh, features. So, categorical perception is uh, considered to be part of learning a language. Babies can discriminate ba from pa and can discriminate these phonemes with intermediate voice onset times. So, by 10 to 12 months babies stop discriminating intermediate voice onset times. Now, after learning um, the category boundaries, it is not possible for um, infants to uh, or unlearn them or and as uh, they grow, they are more uh, set in their ways such that um, the boundaries are uh, fixed. So, um, this results to in, in what we know as native perception versus non-native perception and once the category boundaries become fixed, it becomes very difficult to unlearn those boundaries and learn other sounds and also it is supposed to lead to accent in speakers because of the early perception of category boundaries. So, uh, we just talked about voice onset time. So, this is ba. Ba. what we want to show here ba. is um, voice onset time. So, you will hear three sounds. 
Now, in this diagram, let us explain this diagram a bit more. In this diagram, you will see that there is um, something noted as VOT and which you know as voice onset time as when voicing starts and uh, then release of closure. So, it is a stop consonant, if it is a stop consonant, there will be release of closure. So, depending on the VOT, the category boundaries will be different. So, let us hear the three sounds here and see how the category boundaries uh, could be different for these three sounds. Ba. So, we see that um, the voice onset time there is pretty, uh, takes a lot of time, so 20, 250 milliseconds. So, uh, the vowel is a. Ah. Now, you heard one sound. Ba. So, now you hear another sound around 50 milliseconds and now you hear a third sound around ta. Ta. 10 milliseconds. So, what categorical perception with relation to VOT says is that you do not hear anything intermediate, you hear only two categories which you must have heard when we played the first two sounds, you probably heard the same sound when we played this 10 millisecond pa sound, then you only heard another category. So, that is the ability of categorical perception that we have as human beings. So, again let us play with 20 milliseconds. Ta. Ta. Okay. So, this is the category boundary that we are talking about around 30 milliseconds. So, at that category boundary, you can on either side of it, you can hear either on one side you will hear ba, on the other side you will hear pa. So, let us play all the four sounds again one by one, so that the point is clear. Ba. Ba. Pa. Pa. Okay. So, at 10 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds, what you heard must be the same sound and what you heard at 50 and 250 must be the same sound. So, that is uh, what is called categorical perception of sounds and that is a, a VOT voice onset time is supposed to be a, a very significant cue for voicing across languages. So, what you uh, just uh, heard can be expressed uh, like this in terms of results of experiments. So, these are, uh, these are called VOT experiments which involve identification functions and so where uh, participants are um, forced identification experiments where participants are asked whether they heard a pa or a pa. So, around this uh, place between 20 to 25 milliseconds, there was a lot of change. So, you can see that um, the at this category boundary, percentage of pa responses go down significantly and at this point again, the perception of ba responses go up to 100 percent. So, this is the boundary that intersects between these two sounds and uh, helps us to identify two categories and this is this is called a categoric boundary or a phonetic boundary and this boundary is pretty much stable and uh, speakers learn such boundaries for learning um, languages for learning uh, consonants in languages and this helps you to distinguish between two categories. So, here you see that um, what this experiment means is that uh, in the x axis you have all these um, uh, tokens which the speakers heard at 5 second, 10 second, 15 second, 20 second, 25 seconds, 30, 35 and 40 seconds and these are the responses. So, percentage responses, percentage responses go up to 100 percent when um, voice onset is at 25 milliseconds, 
percentage bar responses go up to 100 percent and percentage uh, pa uh, go up to 100 percent when uh, VOT is around 20 milliseconds. So, between these five seconds uh, we have a proper category boundary which will decide whether a sound is this category or that category, but nothing in between. There are other types of experiments also called discrimination where speakers are asked to discriminate uh, whether they heard um, a ba or a pa or they are asked to compare a ba or a pa with another sound and even there uh, where they are asked to discriminate between um, the uh, voicing that they have VOT that they have heard even there um, the category boundary was the same between 20 to 25 milliseconds and percentage uh, you know, correct discrimination that is uh, whether it is ba or pa uh, uh, goes up in around uh, this region of 20 to 25 milliseconds. So, if we take both of these uh, together then we see that both identification and discrimination type of experiments we see that between 20 to 25 milliseconds we have our category boundary irrespective of the kind of experiment which is continued whether it is forced identification or discrimination that is whether the speakers are asked to discriminate well, asked the, is this ba or is this pa or whether they are asked to discriminate ba or pa or whether they are asked to uh, match a sound with a ba or a pa um, that is identification versus discrimination they have similar the experiments have produced similar results. So, this is a ba and uh, uh, from 5 to 20 milliseconds it is always um, the result is always that of pa from um, between 20 to 25 milliseconds all the way to 40 and beyond it is always um, uh, it is always ba. So, now uh, what do we call co-articulation? So, the same phoneme in different contexts will be acoustically different. So, that is something we have seen uh, in our discussions till now. So, these are uh, schematic speech spectrograms of three voice consonants. Earlier we had taken only a one D, now you can see that this is for B, D and G. Uh, and then there are seven vowels, across seven vowels we see the, uh, the form and transitions for three different consonants across seven vowels. The form and transitions that designate the consonant where the form and changes over the consonant to the vowel can be also longer or shorter or move in different directions depending on what the following vowel is. So, not just a direction which is different for D as we can see, it is also length. So, sometimes it is shorter, sometimes it is longer. So, all these very minute changes are help us to distinguish these um, consonants, but they are not invariant unlike what we saw for voicing which is constant um, for uh, B and P. It is not dependent on a following vowel. Here, depending on the vowel, we have a whole varied range of form and transitions and length to contend with. So, just to compare the difference between the um, categorical perception and um, co articulation, which we have been talking that it may not be always invariant. So, we saw an, an example of where speech perception can have a invariant acoustic cue and we can have we can have variant ones like this one. Now, going back to um, categorical perception. So, uh, this is an experiment done by Cole and Miller 1978 that shown that uh, chinchillas uh, who learn to respond when they heard da 
but not when they heard ga. So, they produced an identification function that looks just like that of humans. So, it is hard to believe uh, chinchillas uh, which are um, uh, which are like rodents had a is, has a special speech mechanism. Uh, this suggests that our ability to categorize consonants can be shared with other species also. So, let us also look at uh, infants and these are the similar results um, of experiments looking at the perception of uh, lexical tone by infants who are learning Chinese and infants who are learning English. The infants um, were tested on lexical tone and um, the on discrimination of those tones that had the same uh, difference that is they were either rising or falling etcetera. So, both the groups of children whether they were Chinese or English uh, speak um, learning infants growing in Chinese or uh, English learning environments could discriminate lexical tones as well as the discriminated non-speech tones. So, but they seem to have lost that ability at about 9 months and um, so while the Chinese learning infants maintain the ability to discriminate lexical tones, the English um, children seem to have lost it at 9 months. So, uh, regarding perception again, um, there are various ways in which uh, this is seen, um, uh, theories uh, which theorize on perceptual abilities of children. It is said that infants have the ability to distinguish phonetic contrasts of all languages in the world, but they tune out of the ones that, that they do not hear um, around them and uh, this is one approach and the other approach also says that infants are able to distinguish a lot of phonetic contrast, but uh, the boundaries shift depending on experience. So, um, finally, we want to uh, conclude this discussion on categorical perception by uh, saying that people tend to hear speech categories rather than the small acoustic variations. So, that ability human seems to have. So, there are some um, abilities like uh, speech categorical speech perception which helps us to perceive speech and also that there are a certain auditory sensitivities that we have and the, the category boundaries reflect our auditory abilities also. So, we had earlier talked about uh, acoustic cues. So, what are cues? If you recall, then um, cues are, um, are the information which helps us to retrieve the contrastive uh, information in the speech acoustic signal. So, cues for consonant contrast can be broken up into three main uh, feature distinctions. They are called place manner and voicing and the strongest cues to consonant place are found in form and transitions into and out of the consonant constriction and F2 transition is the most important uh, for place. For sibilant and fricatives, the frication noise is sufficient to cue place, but for other listeners they rely more on F2 transitions. Nasals can be uh, distinguished through their nasal pole and zero but are usually identified more clearly by the form and transitions. So, um, we had actually discussed uh, these uh, things when we discuss acoustic phonetics. So, so here are the F2 transitions, the F2 transitions for stops which and also for fricatives and for nasals. So, these three are important. However, for stop release burst is the, it's also a cue for fricatives the fricative noise is also a cue and what you had seen in our classes on acoustic phonetics nasal pole and zero the the attenuated formants around f2 region so uh, which we um, 
which you call uh, the zero and the nasal pole, um, a very low um, form and around F1, so and also attenuated um, low energy zones. So these are very significant cues for nasals. And um, so, so this for consonant place, whether it's fricative or stop or nasal, and the F2 is gives a lot of information. Apart from that, when it comes to manner, the attenuation is very important. So, uh, for stops, you would hear a stop release burst and the abruptness and degree of uh, attenuation. For fricative noise, it is rather uh, slow. The, the degree of attenuation is also a bit slow. So, you can hear a lot of noise for fricatives. So, that is another big cue for fricatives and uh, for nasals, nasalization of the vowel and again the nasal pole, it is, uh, it is a significant cue. And um, the other important cues are the slope of the form and transitions again for also manner. Manner cues could also be uh, expressed with the slope of form and transitions. So, we have already seen how uh, voicing is um, effectively uh, cued by VOT, the voice onset time that is important. But apart from that, there are also other cues, uh, not just the sole cue for voicing. We have a vowel duration which can be longer for uh, voice consonants than for voiceless consonants. The stricture duration could be longer for voiced than uh, voiceless consonants. There could be aspiration noise for voiceless consonants than voice consonants. The release burst amplitude could be again um, different for voice and voiceless and periodicity will be present in the consonant to cue the voicing. So, these are the many uh, aspects of perception with regard to uh, consonants and depending on whether it is a stop or a fricative or nasals, the, there will be cues related to uh, the uh, place of articulation, manner of articulation and voicing. And um, these are not just one cue as we saw that in the literature, the, the invariant uh, of acoustic cue has been um, uh, is, is does not hold much water exactly because of the range of acoustic cues which are available for place, manner and uh, voicing and also for other aspects of consonants and vowels. So, we come to the end of today's lecture on perception and it shows that speech perception is related to the acoustic um, the acoustic phonetic uh, component, the acoustic signal, but there are a variability of cues and not just one cue which is uh, associated with one sound and um, whether it is a vowel or a consonant and uh, there are many very many variabilities associated with speech. However, we seem to be able to compensate for those variabilities and have efficient communication regardless of the issues of variability, co-articulation regardless of the absence of invariance um, in the cues. Uh, perception always seems to efficiently uh, most of the time present in speech communication and the search for cues will be an ongoing process in the literature in, in speech uh, perception research and understanding how speech is perceived by uh, humans and um, how to understand our perceptual abilities, our auditory sensitivities which help that perceptual ability. All the all more and more knowledge in this area is going to be beneficial to understand speech in greater detail. Thank you for listening and this is the first lecture on speech perception.